Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're ready for a diverse um, a set of talks in the in the field of infection and inflammation, all uh, dedicated, of course, to uh, nanomedicine. And the first to kick off is uh, Professor Dong Soo Lee. Uh, he comes from um, the uh, Seoul National University, and um, he will talk about the spatial uh, transcript Atomics, uh, looking at a mouse model of dementia and uh, therapeutic interventions in that model. Uh, please take the floor, Professor Dong Su Lee. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, good day. Uh, in this presentation, I'll uh, talk about the effect of novel therapy interpreted by uh, spatial transcriptomics in a uh, mouse model. Regarding the recent information, you may have recognized it. Uh, the trafficking of immune cells between systems and CNS has been uh, has uh, uh, seen a abrupt change recently. <clears throat> uh, skull dual vessels of CNS communicate with uh, skull bone marrow systems vessels, and that. Uh, uh, on those channels from bone marrow vessels, uh, dual vessels, uh, there are traffics of the lymphoid cells, B cells, as well as T cells, and also myelin cells, including monocytes and macrophages. In addition, using PARAP biasis model, uh, one mouse was uh, GFP positive, green fluorescent protein, meaning the all those cells from that mouse is shining, green light, and skull and vertebra were irradiated uh, alternatively. And that uh, finally they found bone marrow leukocytes care separately and respectively, the brain and spinal cord. Skull uh, is, uh, the skull bone marrow is taking care of brain and the spinal cord no, vertebral bone marrow is taking care of spinal cord. That was their conclusion. And the more recently, uh, this year, and lung microbiome, uh, their status, uh, the affected by neomycin, they called it dysbiosis. And lung microbiome is also taking care of the spinal cord, <clears throat> uh, meaning uh, the sectional, uh, uh, the that sectional matched uh, relationship between the systems and, and, and uh, each level of, of brain and spinal cord. And once uh, dural uh, vessels harbor leukocytes from bone marrow of each bone, uh, meaning the uh, skull or vertebra and their marrows, and then those leukocytes can pass through uh, fissures or gaps as a corridor to reach, uh, reach uh, the at first the submeningeal space, including CSF, and then via uh, PIA, PIA, uh, the uh, via gap junction of the PIA, they can even reach the brain parenchyma. Uh, in this uh, moving picture, we recently. Uh, visualize the CSF lymphatic efflux using uh, copper 64 human serum albumin intrathecally administered. After two or four hours post injection, we could see from the nose or the dural, uh, the meningeal lymphatics to the superficial cervical lymph node and deep and or uh, iliac and paravertebral lymph node and sacral uh, lymph nodes along the line of the <coughs> vertebra. So uh, based on that kind of uh, information, I tested. Uh, we tested uh, the uh, kindly, a kind of a novel uh, trial of uh, two drugs. One is uh, FTI 720, uh, which is already available as a clinically uh, used drug against multiple sclerosis, uh, oral administration type, and since uh, years ago, and there had been a report, uh, it might be have an effect as an off-label 
one uh, for Alzheimer's disease, mouse model. And another one is the NK cell therapy, which is in uh, clinically phase two trial for atopic dermatitis. And uh, in a preliminary experiment, we found that the APPPS1 model or the 5XFAD model, some uh, uh, several animals have uh, shown uh, the uh, behavior improvement. Uh, spatial transcriptomics, we used uh, STARS, uh, the method, which was reported a while ago, uh, uh, several since uh, 2019. It, it is now uh, commercially available uh, from 10X. It's a, a solid phase and single spot, RNA sequencing and quantification, and linearity is uh, well preserved. And then <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, even though it's a, a, a single spot a type of uh, RNA sequencing method, not single cell, there has been uh, several reports to do the cell typing uh, using the markers in combination based method, and we have developed our own. For FTI 720 therapy uh, for mouse model, it's a, a genetic model, behavior improved. And interestingly, in this map, we could uh, sustain a section cortex, hippocampus, dorsal and ventral striatum, and thalamus and hypothalamus could be well visualized in, in uh, comparison with the wild type. In that transgenic mouse, we could see uh, T-cell signature here. We don't know why. Thus, uh, we did the F-18 labor, uh, the uh, that FTI 720 draw, and we could see, we could not see any uh, brain uptake. And in short term, uh, intravenous, though uh, the FA, uh, uh, FTI 720 single mode from Novartis is used for per OS uh, drop. And FTI 720, if administered, they just uh, first, uh, uh, are going to be phosphorylated. And then uh, they do bind uh, uh, S1P receptor, sphingosin 1 phosphate receptor. And then uh, the binding and internalization is the same. However, FTI uh, 720 phosphor form uh, leads the, that complex to degrade. So uh, upon our uh, data, uh, Sphingosin 1 phosphate receptor, isotype 1. The intrinsic animal, we could not see uh, very well. Uh, the white matter, uh, the S1PR1, uh, the receptor mRNAs in white matter, which is recovered by, by uh, or uh, treat, treatment. And interestingly, Oligodendrocyte signature has gone and astray and a little bit uh, distributed, uh, dispersed uh, the intrinsic animal, and that kind of phenomenon had been also recovered by drug treatment. Uh, at this moment, I'm going to emphasize that uh, we are not uh, dealing with a single cell, uh, just a single spot uh, with a size of 100 micron micron. Uh, the uh, depth is uh, 10 micron, and 1 to 10 cells are captured in the single spot, uh, the average 5. But uh, the marker gene combination could help us the total neurons in a kind of a, uh, the relatively proportional way to gabaritic and the glutamatergic neurons, and which can be subdivided into more subtypes according to uh, prior uh, the reports. So finally, we could see 32 subtypes of uh, neurons according to the uh, marker gene combination. 
And we could see the effect of a drug on subtypes of neurons and subtypes of astrocytes and state-specific uh, microglia here and oligodendrocyte lineage cells. And also we could see the effect of uh, this drug on brain leukocytes and immune cells. Here, interestingly, uh, the dosal striatal signature for NK cells have been uh, the increased after FUI uh, the treatment. And uh, the CD56 bright and dim NK cells show the uh, definitive difference in their distribution. And also uh, TG has shown uh, CD56 right NK cell signature here, those are striatum, and then which was reversed uh, by uh, in the FTI treatment. And the same ha had also uh, shown up, uh, have been shown up here, CNS associated macrophage, which is resident and macrophage, which is infiltrating or other monocyte ones. TG has shown difference uh, uh, compared with the uh, white type. And then uh, the white matter uh, area has shown a little bit difference. And also T cells. T cell markers have been uh, the definitely different from uh, in TG from transgenic from oil type. And also recent, according to the recent report, they insisted that the Five prime nucleotidase ECTO CD73 is the marker of the tissue resin T cell. If their assertion is correct, then we are seeing the difference uh, due to the our trial treatment. So, in summary, in uh, of the first part, the FTI 720 is concentrated in the brain after our treatment, according to the FDA document here. Among major brain cells, those are striatal inhibitory and excitatory neuron subtypes have been changed. And white matter associated astrocytes are, and also those are striatal astrocytes. Oligodendrocyte lineage cells from precursor to mature type, homeostatic microglia as type one and reactive microglia or plaque associated microglia in around white matter. And uh, we could speculate action mechanism here. Uh, there have uh, been so many uh, diverse uh, possibilities. Uh, the, if we count uh, several, FTI uh, 720 directly on brain cells, and or uh, and or a res brain resident infiltrating rare cells, or FTI 720 on immune cells. Why? Because we uh, just to uh, have given FTI 720 to uh, systemic. Uh, pores in skull and vertebral bone marrow, or sub, uh, or even cervical vertebral and iliac lymph nodes uh, draining CSA. Again, NK cells. We've also seen uh, the behavior improve. However, at this time, a little bit variable. NK cells effect on major brain cell types were uh, not remarkable. And effect upon subtypes or subtypes of neurons and oligodendrocyte uh, lineage cells the same way as uh, FTI and state specific microglia. In this case, the microglia, uh, the aging related microglia or plaque related microglia had shown a different uh, direction uh, change. However, uh, that kind of uh, reactive microglia the usually called the DAM, uh, disease associated microglia has shown a little bit difference, but it was global change, so we could not rule out a batch effect. However, in case of astrocyte, uh, by the administration of uh, NK cells, wild type distribution had been changed. In this uh, special uh, gene, uh, several uh, tens of uh, combinations and several thousands of uh, uh, genes have been uh, the scrutinized. Only this gene, uh, the C4B, which is a 
classical astrocyte marker has been changed. And also we've uh, tried astrocyte multiplied by uh, the NK effect pathway. So it's kind of a marker gene combination and also the pathway and then a gene itself. And then what about the, uh, the brain cells? Uh, brain rare cells and NK, TRN, uh, the transient resident memory NK cells or CD56, Bright and DIM. They are transcriptomic uh, signatures or the same way. The transgenic mice had shown difference, however, no effect upon NK cell treatment. And we also were interested in the whether brain is going to take up uh, the systemically injected uh, injected NK cells. No, there was no brain uptake. So the summarizing second part, uh, the tissue resident NK cells in brain were coming from skull vertebral bone marrow or parent size of centers based on this uh, uh, assumption or recent fact among major brain cells, amygdala, gabaragic, somatostatin, one neurons had, changed, had shown changes here. Here. The, these are transgenic animal and then after treatment and only the amygdala, no other uh, uh, the subtypes. And NK effect gene signature on astrocytes and especially uh, C4B, complement 4B or no difference and reactive microglia down, aging associated microglia up, plaque associated microglia down. So, and, and, and uh, also uh, there has been no changes. So by just kind of uh, internal controls, some of the drugs uh, do not show any changes. Some of the drugs are regional and cell type specific changes. So we speculated action mechanism here again, a few, and a few administered in case cells might infiltrate brain directly via bone marrow, dura, subdura, and parenchyma. Uh, this is against the, uh, the classical dogma that brain is an immune sanctuary, no. And administered NK cells meet native immune cells where, uh, that's kind of uh, uh, my last summary, two s summary slides, uh, novel uh, drugs, small molecules, molecular antibodies or cells, with it, molecular imaging and spatial transcriptomy. And uh, this leads us to neuroimmune interface enigma, of which now we have a crude hypothesis here, according to the <clears throat> recent anatomical works by archive in archive, still uh, there. And then in case of mouse, nasal cavity is a one outlet, another is a meningeal lymphatics through a superficial cervical lymph node to deep cervical one. However, vertebra has also an outlet, peri, uh, no, not peri, epidural lymphatic vessels network here, green, and then outside extra uh, vertebral uh, lymphatic vessels network. And lymph nodes are uh, sentinel to the vertebra here. That's one way. And then uh, <clears throat> we could uh, show that here, the influence, the superficial cervical influence D, and, and according to the levels. So uh, the in, in conclusion, circulating immune cells can meet waste from uh, brain or uh, spinal cord in these lymph nodes and that uh, uh, they can ponder upon whether they take care or ignore. Now, bilateral pathways, the marrow venous, sinus venous, uh, the immune cells can enter the brain or spinal cord and they can just kind of uh, send, the brain or spinal cords can send the, um, send the uh, peptides, abnormal peptides or junks uh, the, from uh, CSF to lymphatic efflux pathway and then bilateral one. And we need to find out the details of the communication. 
but to, to understand the roles of the small molecules of flavor or in the new cell therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're running a bit behind schedule, so uh, I, I will reserve questions for, for later because we have, after this session, there's a forum uh, when you can click the link and then we can debate with all the speakers as well as the participants um, of this session. Uh, but very interesting, um, a drug does not need to arrive inside the brain in order to still change the transcriptomics uh, in the brain. Thanks a lot. Uh, with that, we uh, we move to the next speaker. That's Professor Tao. He's from the University Medical Center in Groningen, and he will talk about um, inhalation antibiotics uh, for cystic fibrosis. Professor Tao. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> dear colleagues, I want to give you a brief overview on the developments in uh, cystic fibrosis and especially targeted on the um, <clears throat> infection in cystic fibrosis. And on the next slide is my transparency declaration. And uh, I first want to go over with you what is cystic fibrosis. For those who are not quite familiar with the disease, it is an inheritory disease. One, it, about 3,000 lives born in the Caucasian population is affected with the disease, and it is based on variants in the CFTR gene, which is located on chromosome 7. And this CFTR protein regulates the chloride and bicarbonate transport and deficiency leads to very viscous mucus in various tissues all over the body. So it's a systemic disease. But the major clinical problem is the chronic pulmonary infection and inflammation. And the... <clears throat> The, the, the variants are based on different classes of mutations in the CFTR gene. There are now about two to 3,000 uh, mutations known. Uh, they can be classified into six classes. Class one, that is the, 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 the protein is not uh, synthesized because of stop codons. Or and class two, the protein is synthesized, but um, it is misfolded, it's, it's immature, partly glycosylated. And class three, then the protein is synthesized and transported to the membrane, but is, it, it, its effect is uh, disrupted. And class four, it is synthesized and expressed, but there is a re reduction of the uh, of the transport of the chloride and the bicarbonate. Class five, it's partly defective, and class six, it is uh, synthesized but with reduced membrane stability, so a high turnover. Um, as, as said, it's a systemic disease. Uh, the lungs are the major in involved organs, but we also see. Uh, disruptions in the in, in, in the sinuses in in in, in the skin that's the the, the, the the chloride con concentration in the sweat is increased which is part of the diagnostic diagnosis uh, liver is blocked uh, there is no uh, the, 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 the the biliary ducts are blocked the pancreas uh, the ducts are blocked so there's no insulin secretion anymore and uh, the intestine is, uh, has also thick mucus, which uh, hinders the absorption of nutrients. And usually there is male and female infertility. The major microorganism affecting the lungs is uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And here you see the development over time. Uh, children reaching the age of six to 10 already are colonized with pseudomonas, which reaches nearly 70% in, uh, in the adult uh, population. And pseudomonas infection is um, associated with 
uh, transforming into a chronic infection because the microorganisms are not cleared from the lungs due to the, the thick sputum, which leads to inflammation, scarring, and in the end, the patient needs a lung transplant. The therapeutic developments were huge in the past decades. Before 1980, the only treatment we had available was uh, intravenous uh, antibiotics. But after uh, 1980, we started with the inhalation of, of antibiotics. First, we started with the inhalation of the existing intravenous solutions by nebulizers. And after 1990, uh, dedicated inhalation solutions were uh, de uh, developed. And after the year 2000, we switched to the development of dry powder inhalers. And these are the major drugs used uh, to treat uh, Pseudomonas irrigunosa. So these are the anti-pseudomonas antibiotics uh, used. And the major DPIs are at this moment tobromycin and uh, colistin. When you develop a, a inhalation product, an, 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 yes, an inhalation formulation for antibiotics, you have to face several challenges. And the first challenge is, for example, that you have to select the right, not only the right antibiotic, but also the right salt, and cholestin sulfate and cholestin sulfomethate. We have, and cholestin sulfate gives a lot more um, bronchoconstriction and coughs than cholestin sulfomethate. So uh, our research was directed into finding a safe way uh, to uh, deliver cholestin to the lungs and cholestin sulfomethate was the drug which caused the least uh, uh, problems uh, with inhalation. Then you also have to face that with the normal uh, pulmonary drugs like uh, in COPD and in asthma, we are dosing in the range of uh, micrograms to uh, maximum one milligram for antibiotics, we are going much higher from 100 milligrams to 500 milligrams or more. So you need to, to develop devices that are able to deliver uh, high amounts of uh, antibiotics. And it's typically too high for uh, pressured uh, meter dose inhalers. So you go to nebulization or dry powder inhalation. And uh, the, the problem with nebulization is that it usually takes about 20 minutes, exclude, excluded the rinsing and the maintenance to deliver such an amount of antibiotics. So for patients who have to inhale it uh, for their life, it's a, a, a huge burden in time um, when they uh, use inhaled antibiotics. And uh, patients are also treated with combinations of antibiotics. So that is a multiple of this nebulization time. So the dry powder inhaler was the way to go. And we have developed here uh, different dry powder inhalers in our faculty. And typically the particles are less than uh, 10, 10 micrometers, somewhere between one and, and, and five micrometers is optimal for uh, the deposition in the lungs. But you also have to take into account that the particles tend to aggregate and you have to, to, to device, uh, you, you need a device that de-aggregates the, uh, the aggregates of the powder so you can have a deposition in the, uh, in the lower lung, uh, lower parts of the lung. Um, the different inhalers that are available have very various uh, uh, output characteristics. For example, when you look at the, the, the white part, and that's the amount of drug which retains in the inhaler. So these inhalers are not very suitable uh, for uh, the uh, delivery of high amounts of uh, antibiotics because the antibiotic is retained in the, in the inhaler, which goes into the environment, uh, is spilled in the house, 
and still and, and can lead to uh, 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 microorganisms that are resistant for these antibiotics. So you first uh, you have to, to to develop an inhaler which gives the the, the the, the best amount in the lower airways and the least amount in the uh, in the inhaler and the turbohaler is a nice example uh, of that one. Um, new developments are the smart inhalers. And you couple the inhaler with uh, electronics that give feedback to the patient on the inhalation maneuver they perform or the, the, the fact, uh, the, 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 the adherence of the therapy and uh, patients now get feedback on uh, one hand on, the on their inhalation technique and on the other hand on their adherence and that increases uh, in the end the efficacy of the, uh, of the therapy. We are now in the uh, in, in the development of uh, the, optim in the optimization of the uh, inhalation of antibiotics, but there are much more uh, promising drugs in the pipeline. And one example is the potentiators and the activators of the defective uh, CFTR uh, protein. And um, as I just showed, there are various uh, classes of mutations. And now drugs are developed that are active in specific classes, targeting the mechanism of the, 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 the way that the, the, the protein is uh, misfolded or is uh, early stopped. And uh, those drugs all are now uh, under development, and this is the example of Eva Kaftor. This is the, 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 the FV1 of a patient with a natural uh, pulmonary function, started with a double blind treatment of Eva Kaftor and, con and could continue it after the trial with an open label uh, Eva Kaftor, and you see an increase in uh, pulmonary function. And you see that if you go along this line, uh, you have about 12 years gains uh, before the, um, the, the pulmonary function is uh, on, on the level which was uh, in, in 2006. There are a lot of other drugs in the pipeline at this moment, a bacteriophage therapy, uh, fighting the bacterial infection, quorum sensing inhibitors, drugs that that, that, that interfere with the communication between microorganisms so they cannot organize themselves from planktonic into mucoid forms, uh, antioxidants and biofilm disrupting drugs and, um, in, and other inhaled uh, therapies, uh, gene therapy for example, and nanoparticles of, uh, of silver. But those are experimental at this time. So in the past 45 years, we have had an enormous uh, achievement in the, in the treatment of cystic fibrosis. The survival of the patients has, patients has increased from 15 to 20 years to 45 to 50 years uh, at this moment. So 30 years gained in life uh, and, and a better quality of life than in the past. And inhalation therapy still is the cornerstone, and particle technology is uh, important uh, for this inhalation therapy. And from the patient perspective, we need to to, to give more power to the uh, to the uh, development of the the right uh, inhalation uh, therapy. And dry powder is the the way to go. So I, this was what I wanted to bring to you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the chat. Uh, one question for me. Um, so um, the, the, the particles um, need to arrive really deep into the lung or would, could, you, could you also rely on deposition in the central compartment and then sort of take advantage of the, of the um, surfactant uh, enabled distribution over the lung or is it really deposition at the site as deep as possible? 
Yeah. Yes, the, 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 the aim is to, uh, to deposit the antibiotics as deep as possible because also in the central parts of the lung, the mucus is very thick. So there's hardly any transport okay. of the drugs into the deeper parts of the airways. So the, 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 the particle size is critical in this respect. Yeah. Uh, one question uh, in the chat. Um, what, what about the prospects for gene therapy in, in this field? Is that progressing? There is some progress. The, the, the main problem is that the gene is too large for the normal virus, viral vectors. And uh, so you, you have to think about parts of the gene you bring into, into the lung. And that is, um, yes, that, that's, that's the major problem. Yeah. So the, the gene just doesn't fit. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, with that, we move on uh, to our uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Bindram King from uh, Princeton University. Um, he uh, describes a nanoformulation of D-endolyl methane, a com compound that I didn't know, but I found is a natural compound uh, uh, expressed or present in uh, cauliflower and broccoli. So interested to hear what you can do with it in a nanoformulation. Sorry, um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about development of a tiny methane nanoformulation for the treatment of inflammatory diseases. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the molecule. So when you ingest cruciferous vegetables, such as uh, broccoli, it's uh, going to be broken down by enzyme in our gut called myrosinase into um, uh, indoor molecules. And when these indoor molecules go through uh, the stomach, there is uh, acid condensation happening. And these byproducts are, uh, are the result of acid condensation. And one of them is called diindoline methane, or DIM in short. And DIM is low affinity AHR ligand. And in general, the activation of AHR uh, pathway leads to uh, anti-inflammation in the gut. So people has been investigating this uh, molecule for treating inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases. And another feature that this molecule has is it has a reactive oxygen species scavenging effect. But one of the problems that's associated with this molecule is high crystallinity. So people developed the microparticle formulation of this molecule to overcome this issue. And there has been uh, 22 clinical trials with this microparticle for different uh, indications. However, um, the therapeutic efficacy of this molecule is not uh, documented yet uh, because of low, still low bioavailability, even with the microparticle formulation. So, we thought that we could uh, fix this issue with a nanotechnology, with a scalable uh, precipitation technique. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, why we are going to make nanoparticle instead of microparticle. So for oral delivery setting, uh, nanoparticle, uh, you know, it's smaller and per volume, so the dissolution kinetics of nanoparticle is faster than microparticles. And uh, when you pegulate the particle, it diffuses uh, through the mucus faster than microparticles, which leads to higher decay and PD, depending on which uh, diseases that you're dealing with. And these are proven by our lab and other labs uh, in past years. Uh, in terms of making particle, we have used the technique called a flash nanoprecipitation uh, or FMP. It's just scalable um, nanoparticle precipitation process, uh, which is now being used for global vaccine formula uh, production um, by Fi uh, Pfizer also. So the way it works is you have um, organic stream that uh, contains uh, hydrophobic molecules or amphiphilic molecules. In our case, we have uh, diindole methane, a DIM, and inactive excipients that can serve as a matrix for them, and then a block of polymer that can uh, stabilize all these uh, components. And then when this organic stream meets uh, uh, anti slogan stream, in this case, water stream, in this um, mixing zone, there is a turbulence uh, being generated, and then it you know, leads to homogeneous nucleation and growth of nonparticles. So this is a quick example of what it looks like, where you have a solvent stream with all the components uh, and then water stream that's being mixed in the center uh, 
making the turbulence. It's a little bit different uh, than microfluidics because microfluidics is based on laminar flow mixing, but this is turbulence-based mixing. And since the mixing is so fast, uh, it has a much higher uh, throughput. That's why people use for a uh, you know, large scale uh, process. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to the workflow of making uh, this particle and evaluating the properties. So first, uh, we uh, start with the 10 different types of commercially available leakage uh, with the different tail length and saturation to see uh, to find the leakage that dissolve uh, this molecule well. And then we selected this top four uh, that has a high solubility of dim compared to others. And then we optimized our formulation using this uh, FMP. And we uh, ended up uh, selecting uh, this lipid exona uh, as a cocoa. This is a C5 uh, tail length uh, with a triglyceride form. And then as a stabilizer, we have used the PCL pack. So very simple, three components, DIM, uh, this C5 triglyceride, and PCL pack as a stabilizer. And then we optimize the uh, free drying condition. And finally, we look at the uh, resuspendability for stability. Always scavenging effect and release kinetics of this molecule. And you can see that uh, you know, nanoparticles uh, over, uh, outperform a uh, microparticle or crystal uh, version of thing, except the photostability. But I would say that photostability is still uh, comparable to microparticles. So now let's move on to the uh, data. So, first, uh, I'm going to look at the resuspendability on the left. The one on the left is a commercially available dim microparticle that's uh, been used in uh, clinical trials. And you can see some sediment uh, on the bottom. Uh, it's probably because of something that dissolved in the water or it dissolved, but it's so big and it just you know kind of submerged right away. But you can see very suspended nanoparticle once you know, add water into the powder. And the size of the particle is around 200 nanometer, and PDI is 0.2, which is not that bad for oral formulation. And then we tested the photostability by dissolving uh, each formulation uh, into water. And then we irradiate uh, this molecule under UV uh, for three hours. And you can see that the microparticle has much higher uh, stability compared to DIM. Uh, I mean, it's almost 100% protection. Uh, DIM nanoparticle lose about 30% of uh, molecule, but uh, still it's significantly better than DIM molecule. Uh, next, we tested the uh, reactive oxygen species scavenging effect. Uh, I talked about uh, you know, this scavenging effect of DIM. Uh, we have used uh, two, uh, we, we included the two different uh, positive controls, L-ascorbic acid, which is known to be potent antioxidant effect, and then molecularly dissolved DIM. Uh, so what we did was we dissolved DIM into organic solvent, and then we squirted it into the water so that it's kind of molecularly dissolved, not the crystal. Uh, and you can see that Molecularly dissolved DIM has a much uh, higher uh, scavenging effect compared to uh, L ascorbic acid, uh, vitamin C, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, IC50. And when you compare uh, DIM nanoparticle, the magenta line here, with the DIM microparticle, uh, again, DIM nanoparticle has two times lower IC50 uh, for IC, uh, ROS scavenging effect compared to microparticle, uh, ensuring the increased uh, scavenging effect. And, and then we finally uh, measure the release kinetic of DIM in a uh, fed state simulated intestinal buffer during human jet transit time. And you can see that at 24 hour time point, team nanoparticle release three times more DIM compared to team microparticle, uh, which shows that good, you know, you know, resuspendability and good dissolution in a given pH and uh, other lipid and uh, collate molecules in the zinc. And right now we are uh, trying to validate this in ex vivo and in vivo uh, in collaboration with the uh, 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 Gao lab in blockers. Uh, one thing that we do for ex vivo is we make a uh, human enteroid, uh, like you see here, and then we inject uh, DIM nanoparticle and fissidextran in the lumen of uh, enteroid. 
and see and see in a, how well particle is retained and how well this um, this dextrin is retained. Once we inject a toxin into the lumen, uh, it will start to induce inflammation, uh, and some of this feces dextrin, which is about four kilodalton in size, will leak out. And we are trying to see how much dim uh, nanoparticle can prevent the leakage of uh, feces dextrin uh, from the lumen of uh, enteroid. You can also stain, uh, stain this uh, enteroid and get the uh, epithelial integrity. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, this green uh, staining or uh, ECAD healing, and you can see without the inflammation or toxin uh, addition, you have a good uh, epithelial integrity. However, once you induce uh, inflammation, you can see this you know, disrupted uh, epithelial barrier, and we are trying to see how much uh, this uh, disruption of barrier can be recovered by deep nanoparticle. Uh, as you see in this picture. Oh, by the way, the red color is a nanoparticle. Uh, it's qualitative data right now, but we are trying to systemically analyze with more groups. And uh, once we get it done, moving on to the in vivo study. Thank you so much. And these are our group and our uh, collaborator in Rutgers University and funding sources. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, I'm looking in the chat whether there are any Questions for Dr. Kim, um, at least for me, um, it, it does seem as though the inflammatory trigger led to uptake really of the of the nanoparticles. And that that um, is that the approach or, or uh, because uh, I think in the other data point that you showed, it was rather the release of the. Yeah, so I. Can you hear me? I feel like. Uh, Approach, you think? Model, model, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're right. Uh, so, so our goal is to make it capture and then you know, uh, you know, make it uh, you know, release in the intestine uh, using the uh, the uh, pH responsive enterocolin. Uh, so in, in the given pH, we wanna have these uh, molecules being released as much as possible. So one of the issues is that you know this microparticle. Uh, yeah, it doesn't release at all uh, in the stomach. So once in the capsule, we want it to be released as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and and uh, the uh, the uh, confocal image or microscopy image that you that you show, there seems to be interaction also of the particles with uh, with the cells. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, that could enhance, of course, the, the the therapeutic effect. Or is that not something that, in principle, you would rely on? That's just, so we want the particle to in, intact as much as possible until it release. Uh, but I think it's in, in this ex vivo study, it's unavoidable to have, you know, uh, unavoidable for the, uh, you know, interaction between the nanoparticle and uh, the enteroid. Uh, but yeah, in principle, we want it to be released as much as possible. Uh, but rather, it could happen in the media, but as you have mentioned, it could also happen in the cell uh, by uptaking up nanoparticle and being released in the endosome or cytosome. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, then uh, we move on to the final speaker of uh, this session. That's Professor Huweiler uh, from Basel University. Um, and he will uh, talk about translational models to study the pharmacokinetics of nanomedicines. Well, thank you very much, Ray, for this kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to participate here in this session. Can you hear me and can you see the slides? Is everything okay? I can hear you, but I cannot see the slides. The slides, I have shared the slides. Share, okay. Good yeah, that that's more promising. Slides. That's more promising. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there we are. Perfect. There we are. So uh, it's my pleasure to discuss the topic of translational models, which can be used to evaluate the pharmacokinetic properties of many medicines, so which can be used to study their characteristics and optimize their pharmacokinetic properties. Nanomedicines are increasingly used, and a growing number of therapeutics uh, contains nanoparticles as integral parts of the design. 
This is a challenge for scientists working in the field of drug discovery and development. It's also a challenge for regulatory authorities because these nanoparticles have very diverse properties. As an example, we have relatively simple inorganic particles such as aerosol used in pharmaceutical technology. We have viral carriers or we have complex LNPs which are used for gene therapy. And the interaction with biological systems, it's not only a function of the chemical properties, but it's also a function of the physical chemical properties, such as size, geometry, set of potential. They are prone to complex biological interactions, speaking of opsonization, for example, cellular uptake, intracellular processing of target cells. So the big question is on how should we study and optimize such delivery systems? Work, uh, scientists working in the field have come up with complex screening cascades, a combination of different methods in order to achieve this goal. This can be physical chemical characterizations using different techniques, starting with microscopy, DLS, etc., more or less sophisticated in vitro cell culture models. And then after the in vitro part of the optimization, they move on to more complex in vivo models, which are normally rodents. And from the rodents, you can extrapolate into higher vertebrates, uh, such as non-human non -human primates, and you can prepare the ground for clinical evaluation of these particles. However, we all know how difficult, if not impossible, it is to extrapolate from the in vitro situation to the in vivo situation. And this dilemma and this challenge has prompted us to invest in the evaluation of new translational models to fill the gap between the in vitro systems and the in vivo pharmacokinetic experiments, which are costly and time consuming. To this end, we have started together with colleagues from the University of Leiden, the great group of Alexander Gross, to pioneer the use of seabarfish, Daniel Aereo, as an embryos as a vertebrate screening model. These uh, uh, zebrafish embryos are widely used in toxicology, in pharmacology, in developmental biology. And uh, due to this uh, wide use, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different transgenic fish lines which are available. They're characterized by fast development. The zebrafish embryo develops from the fertilized egg to the larva within three days. They're optically transparent, which is very convenient when it comes to visual inspection of these animals. They are not autonomous animals until 120 days post-fertilization. This means, with other words, from a regulatory perspective, these models are considered to be cell culture models, uh, which makes them amendable to screening. We have here a picture of such a zebrafish larvae at 72 hours post-fertilization. Uh, we have below a uh, zebrafish uh, transgenic fish lime where GFP is expressed in the vasculature. You can see that this small animal already has a fully developed brain vasculature, so partially functional blood-brain barrier. And the architecture and the, of these blood vessels can also be nicely observed and seen in the tail region of the fish, where we have the arteries and the veins the, and the connecting blood vessels, which can be observed using uh, light uh, or confocal microscopy. We are using these zebrafish larvae or embryos to do pharmacokinetic experiments. And to this end, we are intravenously injecting drugs of interest or nanoparticles, which are fluorescent labeled, into the duct of Cuvier in the veins of these fish. So we have here the small fish, and using a glass capillary, we can directly inject drugs of interest, defined doses in the veins, in the venous system. Injection volumes are normally in the range of three nanoliters. The total blood volume in these embryos is about 60 nanoliters. 
We are then using confocal microscopy to monitor the fate, the, the tissue distribution, the circulation time of these fluorescent labeled nanoparticles and test compounds in the circulation. And we are thus in a position to characterize the in vivo performance under physiological conditions of these particles. In the first part of our presentation, I would like to give you information about the characterization of the model. I would like to focus here on the kidney function, renal clearance of compounds. And in the second uh, part, I would like to give you an example on how we used this model to optimize liposomal formulations. So the goal was to use zebrafish embryos at 72 to 96 hours post-fertilization to do pharmacokinetic studies and to study their renal function. And the question is, do they already have at this stage of the development a fully functional kidney? The kidney in the zebrafish has a similar structure as the kidney in higher vertebrates. So we have the glomerulus, which is responsible for glomerular filtration. We have the proximal tubule, <clears throat> which is responsible for excretion of more lipophilic compounds by the action of ATPases, specialized transporters. And we have the distal tubular system, where we have free absorption of nutrients or vitamins, which are excreted through the kidneys. Here's the situation in the zebrafish. We have here zebrafish larvae, which overexpress GFP in the pronephron. So the early uh, the nephron or the kidney funk, the structures in the early stages of the development. So we have here the glomerulus. We have here the proximal tubule, and here we have the distal tubular system. And our work was based on the hypothesis that the different anatomical part of this system mimic the same structure and function as in higher vertebrates. This is three-dimensional representation, so you can readily study these structures under the confocal microscope. First question, glomerular filtration, does it work? To this end, <coughs> we have injected different polymers of different molecular weight and with different hydrodynamic radii by intravenous injection <coughs> into the larvae. We have then had a close look at the kidneys. The epithelium was stained with rhodamine G6 to illustrate or to monitor the structure or to show the anatomical outlines. And we're looking if these compounds are cleared in the kidney. And indeed, small molecular weight polymers accumulate in the lumen, as shown here. Their higher molecular weight counterparts are not excreted. They, do not, they are not excreted. They cannot be detected in the lumen of the nephron. And here, the same situation with another polymer, polysaccharides. Small molecular weight is filtered, high molecular weight is not filtered. And actually, the glomerulation threshold correlates very well with the six nanometer hydrodynamic ratio value in rats and human. What about proximal tubule excretion? Here we have used combination of fluorescent labeled substrates of different transporters in combination with specific inhibitors of these transporters. And here again, we see an excellent correlation between high vertebrates and the situation in this fish model. We have here a compound which is readily excreted through the kidneys by the action of these transporters. After injection, we can hardly detect the compound in the circulation. In combination with increasing amounts of an inhibitor, excretion is inhibited, which leads to an accumulation in the vasculature of this compound, being indicated here by the increasing colorization of the vasculature. So here again, a very nice correlation between in vivo, uh, the, this fish model, and higher vertebrates. This tubular reabsorption was studied using folic acid or vitamin B9, which was fluorescent labeled. This vitamin is excreted by glomerular filtration and then reabsorbed by tubular reabsorption in order to inhibit its excretion by the kidneys. 
So no excretion and high plasma concentrations in absence of an inhibitor, ready excretion, no e-absorption, and loss of the folic acid derivative in presence of free folic acid as an inhibitor. Again, we observe a behavior which is very similar in these fish larvae or the fish embryos as compared to higher animals and vertebrates. Based of, on this type of experiments and validation experiments, we became confident that this fish model can be used to study the pharmacokinetics and tissue distribution of fluorescent labeled nanoparticles. And we moved on to make use now of this model to optimize liposomal formulations. And this I would like to show you in the following slides. We had three different types of conventional liposomes, which were made up of cholesterol and phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine was characterized by fatty acids with different chain lengths and different types of saturation. The size of these liposomes was always the same, around 100 nanometers. The polydispersity index was comparable. The setter potential was comparable. The only difference was the phase transition temperature of the incorporated phosphatidylcholine of the lipid, which ranged between minus 70 and 66 degrees. At 28 degrees, the temperature at which we carry out the fish experiments, one population of these particles had thus a flexible soft shell. And for the other type of particles, we had a crystalline state of the phospholipid membrane. So we were dealing with rigid structures and rigid phospholipid bilayers. In the zebrafish model, we saw striking differences. The hard particles with a high transition temperature were rapidly removed from the circulation. They did accumulate at the level of the cardinal vein, where we have a high concentration of macrophages and phagocytotic cells. The soft particles with a low transition temperature showed, in contrast to this, a long half-life in the circulation and limited interactions with cells of the immune system. And this effect can be quantitated in a semi-quantitative way, so we can determine a circulation factor, which was higher for the soft particles, and an extravasation factor, which was as well higher for the soft particles. The question arises, how does, do these results correlate with the situation in higher vertebrates, so in the mouse or in the rat? And to this end, we did perform a series of pharmacokinetic experiments here are PK studies in the red shown, where we used doxorubicin labeled loaded liposomes, the same liposomal formulation as used in the zebrafish experiments. And here we observe a very nice correlation between the increase in the circulation factor and the extravasation of the soft particles with the corresponding pharmacokinetic data in the red we have an increase in half-life in the circulation and the marked increase by almost a factor of 10 in this respect to area under the plasma concentration time curve. So we can confirm these results from the zebrafish in the pharmacokinetic experiment with rats. And looking at the literature, we can also make corresponding correlations this data from clinical trials in the human. We conclude from this experiment that complex interactions of engineered nanomaterials with biological systems can be studied using the zebrafish embryo as a convenient vertebrate screening model. And this is also in line with the three R principle of animal protection. Important organ function are conserved, 
we had a close look at the kidney where we have a good correlation between the situation in this teleos and the human or higher vertebrates. And I've shown you an example of the application of the zebrafish model, which was used to optimize liposomal formulations. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to thank and mention my collaborators, my students and partners from other universities, which have contributed to these experiments. Thank you very much, and I'm open for your questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Huwana. Um, interesting. Uh, I mean, it's, it's always fascinating that, that what seems to be so very far away from um, uh, the, the, the vertebrates, uh, or, or no, no from, from, from mammals, let's, let's put it that mm -hmm. way, uh, yeah. uh, both in, with respect to maturation as well as, as evolutionary, are, are so similar. Did you ever encounter uh, a, 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 a particular phenomenon where, where it didn't correlate up to now? Or is it always, uh, well, almost almost the same as, as you would encounter in mice and rats? <laughs> yeah. Um, we had here a close look at renal excretion. We had an excellent correlation. Uh, the situation is different for the liver because at this stage of the development, the embryos of the larvae have not yet a fully developed liver. So the liver consists of a few dispersed uh, single cells, which still have to maturate. So it depends very much on, on the type of organ and the type of question you're interested in. With respect to the blood-brain barrier, they have a partially developed blood-brain barrier, not fully developed uh, blood-brain barrier. This will take uh, approximately 10 days until this structure is fully functional. Uh, with respect to the sinusoids in the liver, in teleost, we have different structures. Uh, the blood vessels in the tail region of this uh, of these fish take over this function which we have in, in, in higher vertebrates in the liver. So this interaction with scaffolding endothelial cells and macrophages can be studied using, uh, using this model, but, but not phenomena such as metabolism and hepatic uh, degradation. Okay, and that is why you also focus on that area of the fish in order to characterize yes, right. circulation time. And right, because here yeah. these, these are the analog structures to the liver sinusoids. Right at this developmental stage. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the chat whether there are any additional uh, questions. If not, then um, we uh, we get ready for the uh, the debate room. Um, so there's a link in the chat for everyone to follow, including the speakers. If you click on that link and remember the passcode one four three five five six, then you will arrive at a new uh, meeting room where we uh, where we can continue our discussions so with that i close this session thank you for your attention uh, and i hope to see you in the debate room in a minute thank you <laughs>